I'm Jeff Wolf. I'm the director for the Center of Executive Education here at Mercer University. And as we've been doing for the past, oh boy, five, six months now, we are presenting free webinars through our School of Business. And we're excited to introduce you today to Dr. Nick Volkov. Uh, Dr. Volkov is going to speak about education and career choice as central ele elements to maximizing wealth. You're going to hear some information today that probably will open up your eyes. Some of you might say, yep, I've been there, done that. Others of you may be looking and saying, hmm, this is good for me to know. I want to make you all aware the presentation is about 45 to 50 minutes. There will be time for questions throughout the program, as I will check uh, on the Q&A section. If you have any questions to ask Dr. Volkoff, please include them there. I will ask them throughout the presentation. I may save some toward the end of the presentation as well. But at this point, I want to introduce Dr. Volkov, let him tell you a little bit about who he is and tell you why this topic was important to him. And, and Nick, I'm going to take myself off the screen and I will pop in as different questions come up. But please uh, take it over from here. Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, as Jeff said, my name is Nick Volkoff. I'm a professor of finance uh, here at Mercer, and I also do um, a fair, uh, so I do some traditional finance research that would probably be very boring for a presentation like this, but recently I also got into this uh, kind of um, area of uh, trying to look at the worthiness of education in general, and that's kind of what we're going to be uh, talking about uh, to, to talking about today in these um, in these uh, short webinar. So just to give you a little bit of an outline, so we're going to talk about wealth in general and uh, the effect of education on wealth. Then I'll introduce a what I call a wealth model. It's going to be a little bit theoretical, but I'm going to uh, just bear with me. I'm going to try to simplify it as much as uh, as much as I can. This is just to kind of build a little bit of a uh, foundation. Then we're going to look an, at another uh, slightly theoretical component of it um, uh, to show how uh, how um, education and career choice work into the uh, and the wealth model work into the idea of investing. Then I'll give you some uh, applied illustrations. And then, of course, uh, you know when we're talking about education, student loans is obviously a big issue right now. If you um, uh, pull up um, any news and the uh, you know and the discussion of uh, uh, the financial situation on the individual or even on a global level, student loans really come uh, come as um, uh, come at a forefront of it and the issues that we have with student loan defaults. So we're going to look at a little bit of. Um, kind of data on what people actually think about student loans, what people who took student loans think about the student loans. And we're going to look at it from different perspectives, and then I'm going to conclude um, and open it up for questions. As, as Jeff said, actually, uh, I am more than open to answering question as, uh, questions as we go through the presentation. So please feel free to type your questions, and that Jeff will relay them to me, and I'll try to answer to the best of my ability. So this, this project in general started actually as, um, as a project more so in financial planning. We were, uh, we were thinking about the effect of education and career choice on financial planning. So bear that in mind as I go through these, uh, through these uh, presentations. So what is the traditional approach of financial planners or traditional recommendation that um, that a, a financial planner will give you. If you go to a financial planner, almost uh, irrespective of what's your age, right? Mm -hmm. So they're going to say, avoid debt. That's going to be one of the first recommendations. And the second recommendation is going to be start saving for retirement as soon as possible. Right, because we know that the sooner you start start saving for retirement, the less percentage of your total earnings or your total income you need to allocate to your retirement portfolio to then, when you retire, maintain the same standard of living. Just to give you kind of a little bit of rough numbers, right? If you start saving for retirement when you're about 25 years old, 
and you save systematically save seven percent of your uh, of your earnings you will m retire and not change your standard of living from when you were uh, from when you were working however if you start saving at like uh, 35 let's say that figure instead of seven percent you now need to allocate 15 to 18 percent of your earnings to the retirement portfolio if not a little more even to the retirement portfolio to it arrive at the same exact result meaning no change in your standard of living when you retire so start saving asap right and then the uh, another another um uh, recommendation would be invest in a diversified portfolio and by diversified portfolio we mean portfolio of stocks bonds and real estate so you have you don't put all your eggs in one basket and it's nicely spread and one important component of it too is that a proportion of bonds in your investment portfolio right should go up as you age as you near retirement then the key, key idea there is is that the younger you are the more risk you should be willing to take we know that investing in stocks or equities or is more risky than bonds and as you near retirement right you reduce your level of risk and then when you finally retire you probably want to be almost 100 percent in bonds and just live off the interest that the bonds are generating to you because you don't want to take any risk of losing your net worth what you're interested in then is kind of net worth preservation and living off the interest that the that your retirement portfolio generates for you so now let's talk about the wealth or the net worth of the individual right the typically typically it's measured as the market value of all real estate and financial assets that an individual has so whatever your minus right or the uh, the market value of those of those assets minus whatever liabilities you have and what are those assets they are real estate right maybe you have a private business you have cash in a bank you have stocks you have bonds minus whatever you owe becomes your net worth and that's a traditional model that's a very traditional model of looking at individuals net worth so now let me throw these kind of thought or the setting out to you and ask you a question so let's say that we have two individuals both of them are 27 years old one individual has no high school diploma he's a laborer he works for 11 dollars an hour and he does not get any overtime but he recently inherited recently inherited one million dollars right and then we have a second individual individual b who is also 27 years old. He has a bachelor's degree in pre-med and he's now finishing medical school. He has no income at this time and he has $200,000 in debt. So if I put forth the question, who is wealthier? Who is wealthier? Well, many or traditionally, we would say that individual A is wealthier because he has a million dollars in the bank and he also makes eleven dollars per hour consistently well we want to kind of challenge that traditional uh, that traditional view a little bit and let's look at the uh, you know before we go any further i want to just real quickly look at some um literature right i want to look at some literature this is something that we academics traditionally do right and there's a bunch of papers i'm not going to focus too much on these but there is many papers that show that increase in the level of education results in higher earnings right um and uh, there's papers uh, that show that um that there is an increase there is an increase in earnings overall earnings of individuals with increase with, with um, attainment of a college uh, degree as you can see in this study here 86 percent of uh, survey respondents said that they think that their education was worth the while there's also something very important that i'm not going to talk much in this presentation about but this is certainly uh, something that every person should think of so this study right here, which is Skug et al. 2011, and it was recently followed up with another paper that shows the same results by the same authors, uh, same results on the more recent data, shows that consistently, 
obtaining more education results in longer work life expectancy. So essentially speaking, people who have a bachelor's degree actually work about three years longer than those who have high school diplomas. People who have master's degrees, generally speaking, work another three years longer than, than the bachelor's degree holders. Um, than the bachelor's degree holders, right? And then people with PhDs appear to work another three years longer than those that uh, that um, have um, that have master's degrees. So if, again, just summarizing these people who uh, have, let's say, master's degrees generally are working six years longer than those who only have a high school a high school degree. Now. To many of you who, who are younger, this may sound like, wow, well, that's uh, who wants to work longer, right? Reality, however, is the reality, however, is, is the ability to work longer is very important, right? These, these finding of this paper actually um, it essentially documents that people with lower degrees have more physical jobs, more labor intensive jobs. As a result, they cannot work as long. Well, what happens if we cannot work as long? Well, A, we stop contributing money to our retirement and B, we start drawing money from our retirement. So there is a little bit of a multi multiplication effect from um, a uh, multiplication effect from the ability to work longer, right? The longer you work, the more money you can contribute to your retirement fund and the less money you will draw, more money will accumulate. The more the likelihood that you'll be able to maintain your or even improve your standard of living into the future, okay? So moving on, uh, I want to introduce these kind of our idea of the wealth model. Let's define or let's denote total wealth of an individual as these W. And I'm sorry, there's going to be just a couple of slides of formulas, but I'm going to try to simplify it as much as I can. So let's say that wealth is the overall, is the overall wealth of an individual. And then E is the uh, present value of earning capacity or the human capital that an individual possesses. And then I is the investment capital of the individual, is those value of those stocks, bonds, real estate that the in individual has. And now let's go and define this, uh, this idea of human capital or the earning capacity of the individual. We're gonna define it as the sum of the present value of all of the future earnings of the individual, right? So E is their starting earnings and then they grow at some rate and then we discount them to present at a certain investment rate, right? We discount those, the value of those future earnings to present. And we're gonna say that that, that, that present value, that value of human capital essentially is what we're measuring here is part of the overall wealth model. And then we're going to say, and then this is the same formula as I had on the previous slide, but then we're going to say that these earnings in any given year, so this E right here, these earnings in any given year are a function of individuals level of education, individuals occupation, so their education choice, their career choice, right? So what education did they get? What career did they choose? Where did they, where, what career are they working in? And X is the individual's level of experience. We know that generally speaking, the longer we work in an occupation, the more we're making because we have more experience, right? And then we're going to also say that, uh, well, for this year, we're going to make an assumption that an individual has zero wealth, zero investment wealth at the beginning of their career, at the beginning of their uh, working career. And we're going to say that this individual is going to allocate a certain percentage of their annual earnings, a constant, or it doesn't really have to be constant, but let's say for the sake of this presentation, let's say that uh, the individual is going to contribute a constant percentage of their earnings to an investment portfolio, and then that investment portfolio is going to grow and produce return I. Okay, so looking at those, and you can almost forget about those formulas because I think that this visual presentation of it is much better and much clearer. So when we 
apply those formulas and we compute, and let's look at the orange line first, we compute that present value of future earnings of the individual, we find that the uh, human capital of an individual from the time when the individual starts working to the time when the individual retires looks about like this, right? Remember, we also said that this individual is going to allocate a certain percent of his or her earnings to an investment portfolio. And the investment portfolio is going to grow and until retirement. And then after retirement, the individual is going to start drawing uh, the, the money from that portfolio and live uh, and live um, of this retirement portfolio. And in this particular illustration, it's assumed that when individual decides to retire, he or she does not return back to the labor force, so does not go back to work. And it's also assumed for, for the purposes of this specific illustration, it is also assumed that when, in, when the life expectancy hits, right, when the individual passes, there, he, he or she actually has depleted their investment portfolio completely. So what's interesting here is this gray line. And this gray line in, is our wealth, is uh, the, the way that we are kind of positioning it here in this research. And that's the sum of the investment, uh, of the investment uh, portfolio of the individual and the human capital of the individual. Um, okay. So now if we kind of convert this graph into a graph, if we, if we say that our overall weight or overall wealth consists of investment wealth and human capital wealth, and we then measure what percentage of our overall wealth portfolio is human capital versus investment capital, we come up with this graph that the human capital as percentage of overall wealth portfolio of wealth of the individual keeps dropping while the investment portfolio keeps growing. Now, what is really, really interesting, and I think telling in this particular picture is that the intercept the, the, uh, the, the two graphs intersect, right, only a, a couple of years prior to the retirement of the individual. So throughout our life, our human capital actually outweighs the value of our investment portfolio for the majority of our life, right? So if we think about these, right, if we think about these what, what this also implies that our education and our career choice actually have a tremendous impact on our overall wealth. This I promise is the, almost the last kind of theoretical thing that I'm going to talk about, but, and I'm gonna be brief here, but in traditional investment, uh, investment portfolio, uh, portfolio uh, management and investment theory, we're always suggested, and I, I've spoken about it a minute ago, we were always suggested to invest in a combination of bonds and stocks, right? And we weigh our how many bonds, how many stocks based on our investment uh, objectives, based on our risk aversion, et cetera. However, and what, what's important in this picture, and I've talked about it a little bit before, right, is that stocks produce generally higher returns, but they also come at a cost of higher volatility or higher risk, whereas bonds produce lower returns, but also provide much lower risk. So if we incorporate this idea of human capital, and, and what our objective is, obviously, is to get the highest return with lowest risk. So if we incorporate the ideas of human capital that I just talked about into this model, we're going to find that human capital provides very high return at a very lower risk. And what's interesting is that the more human capital you can build, the lower actually the risk of it is, which is, which is very interesting. And how can I illustrate that as well by looking at, by looking at, sorry, by looking at historic unemployment rates for people with um, with different education levels, right? If we say that we can build our human capital by getting more education or by going into more lucrative careers, it's important to see what is the employability. So in 2017, people with no high school diploma experienced a 7.7% uh, unemployment rate, whereas uh, in the same year, people with bachelor's degrees or higher experienced only a 2.5% unemployment rate. So if we measure 
the riskiness of the investment of human in human capital by the probability of being employed just from these simple statistics we actually see that the more we invest in our human capital the lower the risk of our investment is because because uh, of the higher probability of being employed okay carry on go ahead got one go ahead. quick question that came through which the question that's coming through has to do with what's going on now with with our economy and covid um can you off the top of your head, the way the question is worded, can you apply what you, you're doing here to what you might expect the result would be after COVID-19 based upon level of education, people who are out of work, will those numbers be the same considerably or will they change dramatically because of such a pandemic? Okay, so the, the, this is a great question, and I'm going to give a little bit of a two-prong uh, kind of two-prong response here. Like the, this pandemic is awful, right? And it's changing our economy, and it's changing the, the 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 economy rather drastically. My personal view first is that the impact of those uh, the impact of this pandemic on those who have higher levels of education and more uh, more professional careers is going to be significantly. And so far, all the data shows that it. Actually, that, that, that this is correct, that it's significantly lower than on those with lower levels of education. So that's it, so generally speaking, if anything, I see the amplification of uh, the, the, uh, the things that I'm talking about in this presentation specifically as a result of the as a result of COVID pandemic. So I only see um, I only see the value of specific, you know, the, the, the value of education actually increasing because we're going to even a more specialized type uh, economy. Now, the second aspect that, uh, that, that I cannot just admit is just putting this pandemic in, actual, in an actual kind of historical context or historical perspective. And I think, I think it's very important. And I think many people are terrified of this pandemic and they fail to look at it in, in, a, in a broader type of, uh, in, in a broader uh, view. So I, I, as you can hear by my accent, I'm not from the United States. I grew, I was born and I grew up in the Soviet Union. Then Soviet Union fell apart and turned into Russia. I, unlike most Americans, was still vaccinated at the, uh, when I was a child. And I have two scars on my shoulder here from a, I believe a polio and a tuberculosis or something vaccine, right? Both of those, both of those, um, uh, both of those, um, diseases were significantly, the mortality from them was uh, many, many times higher than the mortality from COVID, okay? Uh, when was the last time you've heard about any, you know, about, about either polio or tuberculosis as being an issue? So where am I going with this? Yes, today, it looks awful. People are dying every day, right? But I firmly believe that give it a few years. Uh, the medicine today is amazing. Give it a few years. And uh, we are going to remember about this COVID pandemic as a small blimp. And uh, it's, it's not going, it, it's going to have long-term effects in terms of the way we conduct business. There's going to be more Zoom. There's going to be more remote working. But I can, I am almost certain, I am certain actually that few years and we're going to be back to our normal lives. Yes, they're going to be a little bit different, but the economy is going to go to normal with some, uh, with some just small changes. And one more thing, uh, what in my view, what this pandemic did is actually, it did not necessarily change anything fundamentally for the way we live. What it, the only thing that it actually did is accelerated certain processes. I mean, moles were dying already. Uh, the idea of working from an office was already dying. So all that has happened, it just accelerated progress. Jeff, I see that you may have another question or something. I do, as a matter of fact. Uh, in the wealth model, wealth equals human capital, the person currently possessed plus investment person currently possessed and human capital in question is human capital equals education plus career plus level of experience. My question oh, so, is, the, the question is, 
how can we include expertise of an individual in this? As in some jobs, expertise plays more important role than the experience. Okay, well, expertise, generally speaking, come from education and experience. So no one is born with expertise. So we can actually, technically, we can actually explain expertise as a function of experience and education. Generally speaking, an expert is the one who both had formal education on a topic and has experiences on the topic. There is no other way to acquire expertise that, that I can think of immediately. One, one quick correction, the, the, um, so this idea of these earnings, they're not a function of career plus education plus experience, it's a function of. So it's not a simple sum, it's a function of. And I'll show on, in this next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of the mechanics of a, of a more empirical quantitative approach to addressing this issue. And I think that maybe this will help, uh, this will help answer this question also. So what, are we, what it is that we're doing here in this next stage, so, so everything I've spoken about so far has been kind of theoretical. This is more of a practical approach of it. So we actually took the data from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. They do something called American Community Survey, right? It's where a bunch, it's where millions of people are surveyed and the questions are asked as demographic questions. And most importantly for us, employment and earnings questions are asked of individuals. And um, these, um, these, survey is actually mandatory if you don't this is done by the u.s government and you, if you don't respond to the survey you can actually you, you'll be fined a hundred dollars so it's a it's a very broad survey we take about 4.5 million responses to the survey from uh, the period for 2012 through 2016 and we run what's called a regression and i'm not going to go into details of it but what is the idea here is that we're going to take we're going to sort people People by their occupation and we have over 600 different occupations that people declared in the survey right 600 occupations that are recognized by the Bureau of Labor and Statistics and then we're going to take 11 different education levels anywhere from no no schooling at all to a doctorate or a professional degree and everything in between and we're going to sort these people we're going to sort these people by at the same time occupation and their level of education and then we're going to take their wage we're going to take whatever their wage is and we're going to explain it by their age and age squared and i'm not going to go into detail why we're doing age squared these just believe me these proxies for how individuals earnings grow as they get older essentially and then we're going to build what's called an age age earnings profiles it's a graph that looks like this and it says that on average an individual so here we have a compliance officer right so on average this is what earnings of a compliance officer look like the blue one is a compliance officer who only has a high school diploma Okay, this is what, if you are a career compliance officer, but you, and, and you have only a high school diploma, you're going to start at about 18, you're going to start to work, and your earnings profile on average is going to look like this, okay? So at 20, you're going to be making this much, on 30, you're going to be making this much. If you are also a compliance officer, but now as a compliance officer with a bachelor's degree, your earnings profile will look like this. So as you can see, you're starting now at about 22, right? Because you, you took four years to get your bachelor's degree and your earnings profile is significantly higher. And not only is the level of it's higher, but what's interesting is that your earnings are growing at a much higher rate as you, as you gain experience. Now, why is there this kind of curvature of it? Um, of the earnings. Well, first of all, earnings grow the fastest when you're the youngest, when you're the newest in a career. Second of all, what we're finding that in many, many, many careers, there is a point at which basically you become kind of too old for the career. What does it mean? Is that for the organization, it's basically cheaper to replace you with someone younger and, what, and, and you start working less hours, et cetera, as you age, right? And what happens is that your earnings actually, in many occupations, the earnings actually start dropping off towards the end of your career. That's not unusual at all. And the green line and the green line is 
the same compliance officer, so the same job description, but the individual now has a master's degree. And you can see that this one starts at about 27. The job starts at about 27. And they pick out, and this is all in $2019, so they pick out at about $114,000. Again, those are either average numbers. You're gonna, if you go to uh, talk to a compliance officer, you know, at Amazon, I'm sure that his salary is gonna be $2, $2 million or whatever. These are just the median figures for the entire population. And we do these, we do these for, uh, so we, we sort these 600 some occupation across occupations across 11 different education levels. So we have more than 6,000 different lines like these for all kinds of different occupations, okay? These figures here below are simple sums of earnings of individuals in a given occupation. So in a given occupations over the lifetime. So we can see that a compliance officer with a high school degree is going to make six, uh, $2.6 million, whereas the compliance officer with a master's degree is going to make $4.4 .4 million. Okay, again, a little bit technical, but actually not, not, not so bad, right? Here we're looking, we're actually measuring human capital. Earlier on, I said that we can measure human capital by taking the present value of all future earnings. So what this what these table shows is exactly that. So here's our different education levels and here's our different, here's our different careers, different, um, uh, different employment possibilities for an individual. And let's look, for example, at the very first one. First line supervisor of retail sales workers, right? So someone who is a retail sales supervisor. Here we ran present values of those curves at each one of the education levels. And what we found that as the education level grows, right, the earnings also grow. What's, uh, what's important here, what's important here, right, is that if you look at the earnings of a high school uh, graduate versus earnings of a high school dropout versus earnings of the person with a GED or an associate's degree, there's almost no difference in these earnings. However, once we start getting to bachelor's and master's degrees and professional degrees, there is a significant increase in this value of this human capital of this individual. What's maybe even more kind of interesting, you know, and I actually put a lot of kind of thinking to it, is that if we look at cashiers, if we look at cashiers, we can see that cashiers with bachelor's degrees actually make more than cashiers with a high school diploma or less than a high school diploma. And I, I kind of was puzzled by these by this result for a while until I went to uh, Trader Joe's, which is known to be paying the highest, the highest hourly wage to all of their cashiers. And I started talking to cashiers there and I found out that like 80% of the cashiers that were at the time at Trader Joe's actually had bachelor's degrees in music history or philosophy or something like that. So I figured maybe Trader Joe's and Tiffany's drives the result of um, bachelor's degrees actually being contribute contributor or even to an occupation of a cashier. This is all very interesting, however, what we are really curious about is how much should we spend on our education to get a given, to get a given, um, uh, or what is the maximum amount that we can spend on a on an education to come out better off? Okay, so if we go to this previous slide that I just showed, and if we say that, okay, let's say that our baseline is a high school diploma, and then let's subtract the present value of future earnings of people with more than high school diploma, uh, I'm sorry, let, let's subtract the high school diploma earnings from some from the earnings of someone who has a bachelor's degree that difference actually becomes maximum tuition that you should be willing to pay to get the to get a given uh, to get a given um, education right and still be better off so for example with first line supervisors first line supervisors actually can spend first line supervisors of retail sales workers can spend up to $131,000 on a bachelor's degree and come out better off than staying with just a high school diploma, right? If you're a cashier, however, you only have $35,000 to complete a bachelor's degree. If you cannot find a bachelor's degree for less than $35,000, you're actually better off staying at a high school level of education instead of going for a bachelor's degree. And even more so, even less you have for a master's degree. So this master's degree figure 
if you want to be a cashier and you want a master's degree, you better find a master's degree, which will cost less than $8,600 combined with the bachelor's degree, right? Where you're not going to find it. So basically the moral of the story is if you, if your passion is to be a cashier, just stay with your high school, stay with your high school degree. One other very interesting finding that again is, is, is I think is worth mentioning is that what we found is that basically no matter what occupation you are in, then uh, dropping out of college or getting an associate's degree is just an awful, lo complete loss decision because your earnings go right back to where a high school diploma holder is, right? And you're not generating, you're barely generating any, um, any return on your investment. As you can see here, almost all of these differences are actually negative implying that you're better off being in high school, just going for those occupations with a high school degree. So that's kind of our research, you know, it's some kind of tips of our research on the topic of this age earnings profile and career, a career choice. And uh, we find it kind of interesting because uh, we, we went into this research, you know, thinking that the value of education has actually dropped and that there, that the value, you know, that uh, plumbers, electricians, etc., are uh, making out better than people with bachelor's or master's degrees who go into different occupations or maybe even go into those same occupations. What we found is that there's consistently, there is actually value in education. And the more value, there is, uh, the, the, the most value there is in occupations, if you also choose the occupation correctly. But in light of uh, in light of this kind of research, the next question that comes up is, well, there is this huge student loan crisis now. Many people have huge student loans and they are kind of cannot get out from under them. So we kind of ask this question, well, are, actually, are student loans good or are they evil? And um, just to give some background, the student loans now are the second largest indebtedness of the United States is higher than credit cards, higher than auto loans. We have 45 million borrowers. The delinquency rate is over 11%. We have $101 billion of 5 million borrowers who are in default. So it's a pretty big issue, right? However, if we look at, if we look at the composition of these student loans and like where, where are all the student loans concentrated, we actually find that vast majority of them are with real, are actually actually have relatively low balances of less than fifty thousand dollars or less than seventy five thousand dollars. So they're not majority of them is not hundred thousand dollar plus loans, and the uh, the rates on the student loans have actually historically been rather low. Particularly the subsidized federal government subsidized loans are actually rather affordable from a from a from a interest rate standpoint. So we move on and I, I'm gonna skip through these. We just talked about, we just talked about these different age earnings profiles. So we want to kind of, we want to kind of look, well, what do people, what do people actually think of student loans and how did student loans actually work out for those people who, who borrowed? Uh, and our key questions here, we're trying to figure out what drives the student loan crisis. What do borrowers actually think? And do they think whether um, whether it was worthwhile taking the loan. So we do a 36 question survey, which we administer through LinkedIn and Facebook. We ask a bunch of different questions, including questions uh, that are kind of demographic and that are edu education specific, but also loan specific. And um, we also ask people, what did they think about student loans? And I know I'm running uh, about taking on student loans. I know I'm running out of money, uh, out of, out of uh, time. And um, so I'm going to kind of go through it quicker. We have about 600 responses here, a nice distribution. So again, when we ask people how big their how big their loans are, we see that in our survey most loans are below forty, fifty thousand dollars, which is consistent with uh, with overall composition of these loans. We find that a lot of people don't have any loans at all. What is very alerting to us, however, is that a large percentage of draw of people who dropped out actually uh, they, they have student loans and that's very bad jeff you wanted to you had a question have a, another question have another question here. all right thank you yes this individual writes and says i am 60 years old and i'm entering an mba program i already have another master's 
but I'm desiring to up my career from mid-level to executive level. Do you think a $50,000 student loan at my age is a good investment in my career advancement? So, uh, you know, at, at 60 years old, I would carefully think, you know, about how, I, I, would, I would very carefully assess the probability of higher earnings in the future. So I would I would really spend some time and saying, okay, will that push me? Will that push me to that next level? And also what that next level is and what is the difference between my current level and my next level? I would then also immediately think about what is my work life expectancy, right? If I am healthy, full of energy, and I'm driven, and I want to work until 75, my equation is completely different from when my goal is of retiring at 65. So I would essentially speaking plot, I would essentially speaking plot the expected difference in earnings over the time when you expect to retire, when you, when you want to retire. And then I would, then I would take, then I would take um, those figures and I would discount them to present. Either I would discount them to present at a rate, at a rate of return that you want to make on your $50,000 investments, or I would see what rate of return, what rate of return would a present investment of $50,000 result in given this future expected increase in earnings. And then it becomes a very simple function, right? If the return, if the return that you the, that you're expected to receive is 5%, I probably wouldn't do it. If the return that you're expected to the, 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 that it will result in is 25%, right? I would for sure do it. So it becomes it's it becomes a kind of personal choice a personal choice, um, uh, personal, uh, let's say, personal level of riskiness question at that point. So assess your future earnings, not, not the future earnings, assess the difference of your future earnings with and without, discount it to present value at whatever rate you want to get on your investment. If your present value is higher than $50,000, of course, go ahead and do it. If it's lower than $50,000, don't do it, right? Another aspect, of course, that comes into play is how hard do you want to work? But again, that's a personal, that's purely a personal choice question. Nick, a quick follow-up to that, I would think, and this wasn't asked, but it's just coming from me. I would also think it might be of interest to know how long it will take to get that additional MBA. You know, well, I, well, well of, of course, right? But generally speaking, that's observable, right? I mean, typically a person who is 60 year old, it, that's been my experience from teaching, but typically a person who is 60 years old is actually studying very, very hard, much harder than someone who is 22 years old. So I've never given an F to a person who's old for 50 years old, I don't think so. <laughs> so because they, they all, they, in fact, if they get for a B plus, they get very, very upset. But so I think that the, I think that the graduate graduation time is, is is very simple it's however the classes are offered and you assume that you'll graduate uh, on time that's it okay all right but I'll yes should should that on. be part of should that be part of the equation yes but that's again in a, in a grand kind of scale of things it's not it's not a huge it's not a huge issue there i don't think i think that the probability of getting employment at a higher rate is actually is actually where it's uh, where it's at right so okay going back to this slide and thank you for the questions fantastic questions if you have more i'll, I'll be happy to i'll be happy to answer them and <coughs> another observation here which i think is uh, which i think is expected is that uh, about 50% of people with PhDs or professional degrees, by professionals degrees, I mean medical doctors, lawyers, right, um, have uh, more than $100,000 in, uh, in student loans. Okay, carry on. Here we're looking what type of loans, you know, it's great to see that most of the loans are uh, federal subsidized and federal unsubsidized loans, combination of uh, federal and private loans actually generally results in highest balances. Just note that those are also the highest, um, highest, uh, 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 highest interest rates typically, right? Private loans charge more than, uh, than uh, subsidized loans. Then here's another, another interesting observation. So here we asked, did you go to 
And did you go to a public school in state, public school out of state, or private school, or a private school, right? And this is, has to do with tuition. So what we found, what we found is that the highest balances in student loans are for, for, for uh, have the people who went out of state, out of state to public school. So the best kind of distributions of of, um, uh, of student loans in terms of how low the balances are, are actually in private schools and in-state public schools. And that's, I think that's an expected kind of result. By GPA, by GPA, this is another interesting observation, but we found that people with highest GPAs actually ha have lowest loans, which is, um, which is interesting because it seems that uh, the outcome is that, well, those people who can study hard are also most fiscally responsible. So at least, at least this can be one of the sub-conclusions here. Uh, but, 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 but that's right. Th that's interesting. And of course we, uh, you know, it, it's alerting when we see people with very low GPAs with very, uh, with very high loan balances, but we don't see almost any of that. You see, these are all zero. So people with low GPAs actually tend to not have, um, loan balances, at least in our sample, to high loan balances, at least in our sample. Here we're looking at um, total loans by field, okay? Total loans by field of study. And uh, we find that in business, agriculture, education, and engineering, there is most people who actually don't have any student loans at all. What's alerting, however, is that in art specifically, we actually have about 20% of people or respondents who have loans over $90,000. And that will become important here in a second. Um, we also see that, we also see that, um, uh, so, so some other observations like liberal arts also has actually liberal, or, uh, liberal arts and humanities also have about every 10th person has loans over $100,000. And that's a little, that's a little alerting as well as the fact that in, um, in the area of medical and law professions, right, we have almost no people without student loans. Very, so vast majority of people have student loans and vast majority have very high student loans. But as we'll see in a second, that actually happens to be okay because of the earnings. So, and here it is. This is, this um, graph here shows your starting pay on the, on the vertical here is the starting pay. And on the horizontal, as with previous slides, we have the uh, total student loan balances for individuals. And what's interesting, what's interesting here, right, is that we have a lot of people actually who have very high loans. So here, what, what I highlighted in red, what I highlighted in red here, is the individuals for whom student loan balances exceed, student loan balances exceed their annual pay when they start, when they start to work. Again, of course, people who have, you know, people who have uh, no loans at all are in best position, right? But we have, we have, we have a lot of people who are making in these kind of 50,000, 40,000 to 90,000 dollar range, but have loans that are greater than their, than their first year's earnings. So that's a little alerting. Okay, now going back into, into a field. And here we're asking, um, here we are asking the individuals whether um, their major selection has improved their standard of living. And I think this, this is a very important slide and I really want people to kind of pay attention to it because what this actually tells us is that your choice of education and th th this probably more so even pertains to how do we, you know, educate our kids because what this says is that People who are in business, engineering, education, health science, law, and medical profession, they are most likely to agree with the statement that their major has contributed to their standard of living. Vast majority of people in journalism and communication, liberal arts and arts said that um, they strongly disagree. Their standard of living has not gone up as a result of, uh, of getting this education and humanities is not far behind here. Um, here, we're asking whether stu student loans were worth it. And overwhelmingly, people who choose those higher, pay, higher paid uh, careers say that yes, the student loans were definitely worth it. Journalism and communications just seems to constantly lag. Liberal arts, arts, and humanities strongly disagree uh, in terms of it being worth it getting this education, okay? Um, 
so here in continuation now we're asking well are were you happy with your higher education in general and your major again same exact story business engineering law and medical yes arts arts humanities journalism no so something again how important is it for us to kind of educate ourselves and our kids on the on the areas of study jeff I've got another question here. All right. Does your model account for pension income for those that find employment in areas, for example, government, where pensions are still provided? Okay, so uh, th th this is a great question. Uh, we in these in these specific right in these specific scenario, we are looking both with the theoretical model and with these kind of surveys that we're doing we're actually looking at earnings only so we do not necessarily incorporate the pensions however um in the in the theoretical model that i talked about in the, in the beginning of this presentation uh we said that there is a certain allocation of capital to the investment portfolio and that is assumed to be by both employer and employee and that's how your investment capital grows so to some extent it's controlled for uh, by that allocation now i understand the pay pension differs from from a 401k plan but there is there is some control however the direct answer to this question is no we're not controlling for the for the pensions directly and and with this said i'm very very suspicious that the strong result of this happiness in education for specifically is actually driven not only by the earnings that education that people in education get because i assume this is mostly teachers who are who are uh, responding here but actually also by the fact that they have those great pensions that they can rely on in the future thank you for this question okay so and here here is kind of uh, the uh, interesting other set of questions here we basically asked hey how did your spending habits changed upon graduation and i'm going to conclude this is rather actually rather important so we asked people whether they whether they bought new cars or went more on vacations or rented or bought a new house upon graduation and what's interesting is that majority of people who had no student loans said no we have not bought new cars we have not bought new houses we have not started we we, we didn't start going on more lavish vacations the people who had higher loans actually were more likely to say yes to those questions um so um and then we asked people whether they think that they spend too much on their cars and their their cars and them going out and going on vacations and engineers and health science professionals said yes education said yes people who are in business humanities and medical dental and law they said no we were just fine and why um uh and why did we ask this question well you know earlier on i showed a slide where i basically showed that the most of the balances of student loans are kind of concentrated between 20 and fifty thousand dollars that's what most of the student loans are if we look at our data that we talked about earlier with the increase in the earnings for individuals who get higher education levels we saw consistent increase in earnings right and we see here that the student loan balances are actually not that great so in our estimation if an individual would not change their standard of living or their expenditure for the first three years upon graduation from the university they would be able to pay off those loans so basically the increase in their pay that they get from getting the education if for three years they would take that increase and instead of blowing it on a new bmw 3 series and a nicer apartment to rent they would just take that money and pay towards the student loans the student loan crisis wouldn't even be here the issue is and these results actually speak to that is that people graduate and they say well i have a bachelor's degree now i got a better job i'm getting paid more i'm gonna go also and spend and enjoy myself more well the reality is if you would just keep your standard of living at the same level as that as that that when you were in college you would not even remember your student loans in three to four years which i think is very 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 important because understand that you know often you also get an advice hey go buy a house 
and pay your mortgage slowly on your house. Why is that not a bad advice? Well, it's because houses appreciate. Student loan is a loan, it's a sunk cost, it's a loan in something that does no longer appreciate. You need to try to pay it off as quick as possible and then you don't have that, that balance hanging over your head. So finally, um, uh, we asked people whether they would have paid, uh, whether if they would have had a choice, would have they paid more on their student loans upon graduation? And we see that people who are in journalism, those are the most in trouble, right? And uh, medical and law wish on, on average, wish that they would have paid more upon graduation rather than delaying those payments. Okay, these, uh, this is some more complex uh, multivariate regressions, but here we're basically saying, we're basically showing that, hey, um, uh, we asked people whether they thought student loans are worthwhile or not, and they answered yes, no. And here we see that it is more likely that you answered yes when your starting pay was higher, uh, when your standard of living went up as a result of getting this education, and you're more likely to answer yes, it was worthwhile tuning, taking on a student loan if your balance was lower. And here we also find, right, that people who are in business education, humanities, medical, and law are more likely to think that yes, student loans were worthwhile than any other profession. So in conclusion, and I know that I'm probably over time already, but in conclusion, I wanna say this, that the education choice, the education choice and the career choice really, really matters. It appears to me that people who you know, who choose certain low pay careers or certain careers that, you know, that don't produce that positive present value are, uh, are just not often not doing enough kind of homework. And then in, in, in I am very suspicious with these results that the driver of the student loan crisis is not the fact that student loans are bad. It's not the fact that education is not contributory, but it's because we choose education majors and areas of education that are not producing positive, uh, not producing positive investment returns. We often, we um, tend to uh, choose our hobbies as our careers. And I believe that hobbies and careers are, should be, should be separate. So uh, I can talk about it for another four hours probably, but uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions at all that you may have. And um, uh, yes, and here's my contact information. If you are interested in the topic or want to discuss it further, I'll be glad to, uh, to answer any questions. And